Hood's grand strategy was to move north. And he thought that would draw Sherman out of Georgia. Uh, Sherman had other ideas, as we know. Um, and beginning this campaign, this was in uh, mid-November, um, Hood actually plans to um, rendezvous with Nathan Bedford Forrest in Alabama, they actually meet up at Florence, Alabama, and then the plan is to march north. And you notice that uh, Central Alabama Railroad, it leads it right up to, uh, to Nashville, ultimately. That's the road to Nashville. Um, John Schofield uh, was sent south by uh, Thomas um, to Pulaski, Tennessee, which you see there. Uh, and the idea was for him to stop this didn't happen, but that was, the, that was the goal of Thomas, was to stop Hood um, long before he got uh, to the gates of Nashville, which didn't happen because what Schofield did was retreat, 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 all the way back. There you see a little better uh, map of this uh, whole scenario. I like this one because it's in color. Um, you can see uh, the maneuvering that's going on. So instead of intercepting Sherman, out here, uh, in dealing with him and his march to the sea, Hood is going the opposite direction. He does meet up with Nathan Bedford Forrest, that part uh, went according to plan, and then they started their march uh, northward. But uh, it becomes a race, actually, between Schofield and Hood, which one was going to reach the city of Columbia. That becomes the next, uh, next target, the next objective. So there's the Hood's strategy to link up with uh, Forrest and then march uh, north with the idea of threatening not only Nashville but ultimately the Ohio River. And then his ultimate goal was to link up with his old commander, Robert E. Lee, in Virginia. If he had succeeded, people ask, well, what would have happened had Hood taken Nashville? That was his plan, was to keep on going north, reinvade Kentucky, take that back. And he wanted to do all of this prior to the election of 1864. That is another key factor. The re-election of Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Because if Lincoln could be defeated, obviously the South had no control over that. But if he could be defeated, it would give the South a chance. With Lincoln's re-election, that was a mandate to continue this war to the finish and kill the Confederacy. Chew and choke until the beast is dead. Those are Lincoln's own words. That's what he instructed his generals to do. That's what he instructed Grant to do. Grant in turn instructed Sherman, who instructed Thomas, and so on. Chew and choke until the beast is dead. That was uh, the northern strategy. So there was a lot of factors here involved. There's the military part, but also the political. Now, Sherman's reaction to all this is, and I know some of you have I've heard several people mention this, this is Sherman's own words, if he, meaning Hood, will go to the Ohio River, I will give him rations. Sherman was delighted. This is exactly what he wants, because my business is down south. Nobody knew yet the full extent of what Sherman was going to do, but Sherman knew, you bet he knew. He researched every county in Georgia, and he had that map in his head, and he planned to go to Savannah, and he was going to live off the land. He didn't need Nashville, or at least not to the degree that Hood thought he did. Um, and so that's why those armies actually separated, uh, and it's weird. When you, when you look at it, it's like, okay, what's wrong with this picture? But that's exactly what happened. It's one of the weirdest campaigns in, in military history. Now, Sherman goes on to order General George Thomas, known as the Rock of Chickamauga, uh, commanding the Union Army of the Tennessee and organized forces in Middle Tennessee, which is where we are, to stop Hood's invasion of the state. Thomas, who's headquartered in Nashville, uh, sent his subordinate, General John Schofield, with his force, I have mentioned that, of 25,000 men stationed at Pulaski, Tennessee, to stop the Confederate Army's advance before it reached across the Duck River. Schofield was a little intimidated by Hood, not a little, a, a lot. And he resolved, I'm not going to mess with him 
I'll go out there because I have to, I'm in order to, but if I can actually retreat uh, and just do enough um, that my commander will get off my back, I mean Thomas, um, I'll pacify him that I won't, uh, I won't have to commit myself. It's a little like General McClellan uh, that way, very, very true. Um, at any rate, uh, he was supposed to advance before uh, Hood's army reached and crossed the Duck River at Columbia. November 25th, 1864, it does become a race between Hood and Schofield to see who gets there first. It turns out that Schofield did, but just uh, barely. Um, within a short time, Hood was there. But um, Schofield's army was able to entrench itself. It was in a strong position, ready to oppose any Confederate assault. So logic would, would ask you, okay, why did Schofield attack? I'm like asking McClellan, why don't you attack? I think Lincoln was probably wondering, uh, why don't you attack? Um, the Confederates deployed themselves in a line opposite Schofields. The Union commander had his back to the river. Uh, that's never a good position. Fearing that he would be outflanked, and this is the answer, uh, Schofield withdrew across the Duck River, abandoning town, the town of the cheering rebels. So what does this look like to the Confederates? We won, right? We didn't have to do anything, and we still won. Um, it gave them a sense of self-confidence, too self-confident, perhaps. It's a little like uh, after First Bull Run. They were very, uh, very self-confident. Uh, there you have a uh, <coughs> drawing, artist depiction of Hood crossing the Duck River at Columbia. Now it becomes a chess board of war. Uh, Hood decided to leave his wagons, most of his artillery, and the majority of the Lieutenant General uh, Stephen E. Lee's corps behind at Columbia to act as a diversion, while he and the remaining uh, two corps swung around Schofield's army to attack it from the rear. That's why I give you that vocabulary. Uh, that makes a little more sense what, uh, what I'm talking about with corps and armies and divisions and so on. This is Hood's words. The situation presented an occasion for one of those interesting and beautiful moves on the chessboard of war, which I had so often desired an opportunity to execute. So Hood sees himself as <coughs> the avenging angel. He's going to avenge uh, Stonewall Jackson, who was a hero to him. He's going to avenge his death. He's going to repeat uh, Stonewall's brilliant, uh, brilliant victory at Chancellorsville. In mind that Hood had come from the Eastern Theater, so he had worked with all of these generals. Um, and he's going to uh, make himself uh, the hero in the West. Uh, he, he wanted to become the Stonewall Jackson of the West, essentially. So he wants to emulate his hero, um, and he also wants to make up for a similar lost opportunity that the South had had at Gettysburg, where Hood uh, was also uh, there. So to cut off Schofield, Hood planned to occupy Spring Hill, um, a small village on the turnpike connecting Columbia and Franklin. It's that, right up that railroad. Uh, Hood reasoned that Schofield would be trapped between Lee's Corps, still at Columbia, and his main army at Spring Hill. At around 4 p.m. on November 29th, 1864, Hood began to advance on the town. There were some Yankee defenders, but Schofield wouldn't arrive until three hours later. Two-thirds of his army was still at Columbia. So I mean, he's moving very slowly. This time Hood uh, beats him to the punch. For his part, Schofield simply wanted to retreat all the way back to the safety of Nashville. He didn't like being out there. He didn't like you know, being exposed this way. Even though Thomas had sent him out to stop Hood, Schofield uh, he didn't like it. And he's, he's very, uh, very McClellan-like. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. Um, but there you have the Columbia Franklin Turnpike. Notice how spread out these Confederate troops are. That becomes a problem because you have confusion in the ranks, lack of communication. Um, the number one thing in an army is to communicate. And when you cut off that communication, that's, that's the best way to, uh, to defeat uh, your enemy. Um, now, Schofield didn't do this you know, knowingly, but uh, this was happening in the Confederate ranks. Hood's intention was to attack and capture the turnpike connecting Columbia with Franklin, and he failed to clarify his objective to his subordinates. That's rule number one in warfare, when you, uh, you have people under you, you've got to make sure, oh, this is true in business too. If you're the CEO of a company, you better be telling your subordinates what they're supposed to do. Uh, he doesn't do this well, 
Uh, so the division commander, Patrick Claiborne, advanced on the turnpike. That's what he thought he was supposed to do. Division commander Benjamin Cheatham believed Spring Hill itself was his objective. The result, unit coordination was impossible. Now, this is probably the big bugaboo of the evening, because we know from Eric's presentation, excellent presentation it was, Eric doesn't believe that Hood uh, was doped up on logging. However, in all of the research that I've done, I haven't found a better explanation for Hood's behavior than that. Uh, I mean, this is one this is one view that's out there. It's been um, you know talked about. It's been put in the literature. Uh, I know Bill, you brought up this question, and that's when uh, when Eric said that it was um, you know that's his interpretation. But all the documentaries I've listened to, and we got some new ones. Like Christine and I were actually viewing some documentaries last night that we bought at the, at the interpretive centers, some of which Eric was on. No one has provided a better explanation than that. What was Hood thinking? How did he allow an army to pass him in the night without knowing it? Actually, I hope that is true, because that would, that would, that would give uh, Hood some credibility. If it wasn't, then he's just plain, sorry to say, he's plain stupid for allowing that to happen. But I, I, don't, I don't have a better explanation for that. So if someone does, if someone has a, a better theory as to what happened there, that debacle at Spring Hill, um, but whatever happened, it certainly permeated the ranks of the Confederate Army. Because the next morning, Hood, for whatever reason, but now Hood is, is back to being uh, in control, or thinks he's in control. Um, Hood is angry. Hood wants vengeance. You, know, you guys screwed up. Notice what he says. You guys screwed up. Not me. You guys. And I'm going to punish you. I'm going to make you pay for that. You boys are going to get in there and you're going to fight. You're going to do that frontal assault because that's what I want. And I, I'm going to make men out of you. He almost sounds like a drill sergeant uh, at that point. <coughs> Coupled with that, some very bad news reaches the Confederacy. This is late November now. It takes a couple weeks. The, the election of 1864 occurred on uh, March 8th. I'm sorry, November 8th. Uh, March 4th was, was Inauguration Day, 1865. But November 8th was the election. Now we're to uh, mid-November, or actually late November, and the rumors now are coming true, the ones that have been circulating, uh, and it had been reelected. So there was no turning back. Uh, Hood understood this. He had to win. He had to take his objective, which is what leads into the bloodbath at Franklin, because by God, you know, Lincoln's not going to give up. I'm not going to give up either. The South had to win, it had to be successful, or all was lost. So the politics of this become very, very important. Hood was angry at both his commanders and his troops for letting Schofield's Union troops slip away. That's why he recklessly ordered the direct frontal assault um, against Schofield's troops who had time enough to become heavily fortified. Uh, Hood's commanders, uh, Claiborne and uh, Cheatham among them, tried to talk him out of it, but to no avail. Hood's mind was made up. There was to be no retreat. The result, as you know, was a bloodbath. Uh, six divisions containing 18 brigades and 100 regiments of Confederate infantry, in other words, 30,000 men, descended into the valley of the Harpath River and deployed themselves in a line of battle. There was a slim chance that Hood's army could break through the Union line before reinforcements could be brought up. Hood had been a gambler all his life. This was a gamble he was willing to take. His own reputation, his own redemption, if you will, was more important to him than the lives of his men. Or at least that's how it appears. Um, but out of a force of 30,000 men, Hood's army sustained 6,261 casualties, including the deaths of six of his generals. That story is, is well known. Seven of Hood's generals were wounded and one was captured. 
It was horrible. I mean, major defeat. This was, you know, we haven't even got to Nashville yet. Uh, but this was a this was a bloodbath. Now, out of a force of 15,000 men, Schofield's army suffered 2,326 casualties. 200 of them were killed, and 2,000 plus were wounded. Once again, Schofield evacuated his position and retreated toward Nashville. He joined General Thomas behind the city's defenses. So he makes it. He gets back home. Thank God. I, I mean, um, he should have stopped. Too long before he did. I mean, there were mistakes made on both sides. There you see, uh, this is an artist's depiction uh, of Claiborne um, leading his division toward the Federal Works from the bloody assault at Franklin. This is actually a modern reenactment. This actually was taken at the reenactment of the Battle of Shiloh. I was there with the Long Battery. So this would be earlier in the war, but uh, you can still see uh, how uh, how it's being depicted. Uh, of course, uh, we know about the McGavick uh, Confederate Cemetery, McGavick Cemetery, uh, Carton Plantation. Uh, those were the battle sites around, in and around Nashville. I don't have the Carter House pictures loaded yet. Uh, that's why they're not in there, but now I have some, so I'll be adding to this. Um, now let's talk about Grant and Thomas. Uh, neither Grant nor Lincoln were impressed by Schofield and Thomas's seeming inaction. To Lincoln, it seemed like a repeat performance of Generals McClellan and Rosecrans. Uh, Thomas had actually replaced uh, Rosecrans as commander of the Army of the Tennessee. This was some time earlier. Uh, Grant had his own personal grudge against Thomas, stemming from the personal resentment he felt towards him, meaning Thomas, in the wake of the Union's capture of Corinth, Mississippi, excuse me, in 1862. Thomas was advanced, and Grant was short of his rightful authority. Uh, it took a while for Grant to. Uh, to rebuild himself, uh, get back into the war, uh, which he ultimately does, but uh, he never uh, quite forgave Thomas for that. Now, for his part, Thomas was sore at Grant for not appointing him head of the Army of the Tennessee once Grant himself had been promoted as Lieutenant General of the Union's forces. That happened in March of 1864, uh, when, uh, when Lincoln brought him east and made Grant in charge of, of everything. By the way, the only uh, other person that held that rank uh, before Grant was uh, was George Washington, so I mean it's quite a quite a promotion uh, that he gets. Well, instead of promoting uh, Thomas, <coughs> Grant appointed Sherman, his friend Sherman, which to us is no surprise, but to Thomas it was it was an insult. Um, and so now uh, Sherman's at the gates of Atlanta, and Thomas felt slighted because he's stuck in Nashville uh, doing uh, cleanup duty. Um, Schofield and Thomas, uh, they too uh, didn't like each other very much. Schofield had a strong dislike, uh, stemming all the way uh, back to his days as a student at West Point. Schofield had been court-martialed for his conduct uh, there and was sentenced to be dismissed from the Army. That's pretty severe. Thomas had been on the court and declined to recommend that the sentence be remitted. Although the majority ruled to restore Scho Schofield to service and his military career continued, he never forgave Thomas for the, and this is his words, the stern denial of clemency to him. Yeah, Schofield had some, some issues uh, in uh, his West Point career days, as did Wood. Um, in fact, Schofield did better um, in terms of uh, what he accomplished. Uh, he graduated seventh in his class of 52 graduates in 1853. As opposed to Hood, who graduated 44th out of 55 in 1853, it's the same class. Um, and both of them got disciplined for, uh, for, as he puts it, youth indiscretions. But uh, Schofield uh, didn't like Thomas, and, and I think the feeling was mutual. Now, let's talk about Nashville itself. Uh, the Tennessee State Capitol on the banks of the Cumberland River swelled in population for 30,000 to roughly 100,000 by 1864. Uh, it had been occupied by Union troops uh, since 1862, uh, and the rebel sympathizers who remained in the city uh, saw Hood's army as one of liberation. So you've kind of got that fifth column behind you. Um, you know, the Union may occupy Nashville, but they're not there uh, uh, as liberators. In fact, they're there as occupiers, and uh, the civilian attitude toward them uh, is nothing um, short of 
I'm happy. How would you put it? I'm happy, thank you. Uh, military Governor Andrew Johnson had declared martial law in the city and replaced both the mayor and city council members with loyal unions. Yes, that's Andrew Johnson who becomes Lincoln's vice president. He gets shoved upstairs. Actually, the, the Republican Party in 1864 granted Andrew Johnson uh, this quote unquote honor of being the vice president, uh, or actually on the ticket to be vice president. Of course, he does. He ultimately succeeds Lincoln after the assassination. But uh, Andrew Johnson <coughs> had been a war governor, actually, war governor in Tennessee, very unpopular with the civilian population here. Um, and just as he would become very unpopular with the nation's population after he becomes president, ultimately. Um, one of the things he does is he uh, declared martial law in the city, uh, and they, of course, didn't like that. Now, Nashville has a reputation of being the Athens of the South. Uh, the state capital, for example, is designed as an ionic temple. Um, they borrowed a lot of Greek architecture from uh, ancient uh, civilization for its architecture. We, today, there's an uh, exact replica of the Parthenon in the city of Nashville. That's to, uh, to commemorate that as well. But in 1864, it was noted for something else, uh, much less glamorous. Uh, that was prostitution. Uh, Smoky Road near the river was so bad, even soldiers refused to go there. Uh, that's how you bad. Uh, in 1863, the city's prostitutes were deported on steamboats to Louisville and Cincinnati, who even refused to accept them. It might be noted that the people visiting <laughs> I, I don't I don't deny that, sir. But the prostitutes did return to Nashville and okay, what are we gonna do with them? Nashville becomes the first city uh, to legalize uh, prostitution. Now, let's look at Nashville defenses. Instead of attacking who had outright, as Grant believed he should do, Thomas busy himself in building up the city's defenses as soon as Schofield arrived on December first. Some of the outer defensive forts, when we saw that, those rings of defense that we looked at, uh, that's when a lot of this stuff was finished, or uh, rebuilt, or created in the first place. Um, and they're reinforced with additional um, structures and so on. All of this to Grant was maddening. You know, Grant's the guy that wants to get out there and, and get the job done. Um, but a week later, after um, Schofield had uh, busy himself, or Thomas was busy himself doing all this. Uh, no attack had still been made. Grant and Lincoln are both are getting very impatient. Um, keep in mind there's an ice storm that comes through here. So the weather does play a factor. Um, but Grant makes up his mind and he's going to relieve Thomas from command. Um, and that ice storm is actually the only thing that stops him from doing it because he can't get here to do it himself. Um, the telegraph operations are down. Um, and actually, a friend of Thomas was Thomas Eckert, uh, the telegraph operator that's convenient. Uh, he made sure they stayed down, uh, and so he presents, prevents the message from getting through. Thomas finally attacked Hood's army on December 15th, as you know. Um, his careful preparations do ultimately pay off. That's what leads to uh, the victories, particularly of the second day. Uh, there you have uh, Fort Nagley, um, which we visited. There you can see the um, inner and outer lines of defense. Uh, some of the places that we uh, visited today, actually Fort Negley is over uh, there where it marked letter A. Yes. Um, so now we get to the Battle of Nashville. Uh, heavy day of fighting on Thursday. I'm going to take a two minute break. Okay. A second. Just with, sure. with apologies to your presentation. Okay. Just respecting also our catering staff, which is in a fantastic job. Um, my air, um, theirs can retrieve the table coverings so they can be on their way. Okay, and absolutely. For that, but respect so take a two minute recess and then we'll finish up. I've just got a few more slides to yes. go over here.
As he was being led to Nashville, probably on Brandywine Pike, he was struck multiple times on the head by a federal officer wielding the body of the sword. Um, the officer was thought to be Colonel William McMillan, who commanded MacArthur's 1st Brigade. The resulting skull fractures did not kill Smith, but caused him to be institutionalized for the remainder of his life. The street on which the Shies Hill Trailhead begins and where the historical marker is located is named in his honor, Edna Smith Road. The fall of the Confederate left flank at Shies Hill marked the end of the Battle of Nashville. Even though the right flank had held its line in the Battle of Peach Orchard Hill to the east, the entire force broke with the collapse to the west and the Battle of Nashville ended with the retreat of Hood's army toward Brentwood so they retreated back to the south. Um, those are just some photographs. Uh, we've seen some of these in different places that we've been, uh, but you get, uh, you get another sense of it. Uh, the capital was a fortress. I mean, they used it uh, as, as a fortress. You can see the artillery pieces there. Uh, Shies Hill. Uh, that's what it looked like actually in the 1880s and 90s. Uh, a lot of questions came up about whether it uh, was wooded or not. Yes, it was. Uh, and there you can see it, uh, the trees on it. This is only about 20 years, 30 years after the battle. Um, that's the view from the summit. Of course, you don't need me to show you that because we've all seen it. Uh, and there, of course, we have the Minnesota uh, flag flying, which is very, uh, um, it's, it's a nice honor to the, to the Minnesota soldiers that, that fought. Um, this comes from a website, uh, which I have cited there, uh, explaining that fact, why uh, the Minnesota flag is there. Uh, we had the 5th, 7th, 9th, and 10th. Uh, we, there were 302 casualties, killed, wounded, or missing. The greatest loss the state of Minnesota suffered in any Civil War battle. Um, early in the morning, now, who's Lauren Craig? I should introduce him. He's actually in the 9th Minnesota, uh, one of the regiments there. He's from my hometown of Mankato. He becomes a prominent judge. Um, so on, a very, uh, very uh, um, skilled in, in, the, in the philanthropy, certainly. Uh, he actually, his house eventually was donated to be the YWCA building in, in my hometown. Uh, but he was actually a private. On December 15th, uh, 1864, Private Gray rose with his comrades of Company D, 9th Minnesota, and found a dense fog covering the ground. In the distance, he could already hear the rattle of musket fire. After maneuvering into position and fighting all day, the 9th Minnesota helped push the Confederates back only two miles. Uh, this is what happens to Lauren Cray. Uh, he was wounded in the shoulder during a cannonade, part of the Union assault on Shies Hill. It was raining heavily by the time the attack commenced at 4 p.m. I wanted to, but if it does rain tomorrow, that's historically correct. Um, will also be the 16th of November, we're only one month removed from the actual 150th, so we're pretty close. Um, and Cray actually had to lay in the thick mud until his comrades found him uh, and carried him to safety. You know, it's, it's amazing that we can gather here tonight, I'm sitting here in this, in this wonderful audience, this wonderful auditorium, this wonderful audience is here. Think how comfortable we are compared to what they had to go through. Um, uh, it, always, it always strikes me, you know, it, it shivers when you, when you think about it. Uh, Cray was taken to a temporary field hospital in Nashville, which is the Masonic Temple, where his wound was treated. There were so many soldiers already there, Cray had to be carried to the fourth floor. He survived and returned to Mankato, where he becomes a prominent judge, and as I said, a philanthropist as well. Uh, this gentleman uh, was also from Mankato, my hometown. Uh, <coughs> those of you from other parts of Minnesota will recognize him as uh, one of our Secretaries of State. Uh, the Secretary of State of Ohio, before coming to Minnesota in 1857, he actually settled in the town of Garden City, which is just south of Mankato. Um, but he was elected Minnesota Secretary of State in 1859. He resigned his position in 1861 to enlist. Uh, he was a colonel of the 10th Minnesota Regiment uh, and ordered south in October 1863. Uh, one side note, some of you may uh, recognize the name Mankato as being the town where the largest mass execution in American history took place. Uh, that was to do with the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. Uh, President Lincoln pardoned 265 of the Indian warriors, but 38 of them were hanged. Colonel Baker, he was a colonel uh, at that point, but he oversaw that operation in, in Mankato. Then uh, he's later uh, promoted to be Brigadier General. 
These gentlemen you probably have never seen before, I'm guessing. They're not in any history book. They're not prominent individuals at all, but they do, I think, uh, sum up the national story, uh, at least for me, particularly the gentleman. Um, second one in from the back um, happens to be my great, great grandfather, uh, who fought with uh, Company K of the 5th Minnesota Infantry. Um, so that's my personal connection to this battle, to this place. Um, these gentlemen, uh, they're, uh, he'd be right here. So from, from yeah, my left, he's, he's the second one in the back row. Uh, his name was Wilhelm Urban. He was a German immigrant. Actually only been in the country since uh, 1857 uh, when he moved here from uh, the old country. There was no such thing as Germany at that time, but he had actually fought in the Prussian army before coming to Minnesota. He was in his 30s when he fought here at, at Nashville. So he's not the typical age, he's actually a little bit older, uh, but he'd already seen service overseas. He left the old country for a better life. So why in the world would he and others like him uh, his neighbors, uh, that's what these guys all were, were his neighbors. Why in the world would he involve himself in a conflict which he had no, you know, he had nothing against the South. Uh, there wasn't this, this idea of uh, slavery. Um, for him, I think it was about belonging. He wanted to prove himself as a loyal American, as did many of the immigrants who fought. Um, well, they weren't in it for the, for the politics of the war. They weren't in it for the anti-slavery crusade, but they wanted to show their loyalty to their adopted country. Uh, and he did that. And this is actually taken, uh, this photo is taken years, years later, when all of these gentlemen are old. Uh, Mr. Urban died in 1913. Um, but they were very proud members of the local Grand Army Republic. That's what this is. It's actually a photograph, I apologize for the quality, it's not the greatest photograph, but it's all I have. Um, it was actually <coughs> used as an advertisement to sell cigars. It came, it came off a cigar box, uh, and I was able to find it. Um, this photograph is a little, uh, little clearer. Uh, the lady in the black is Mr. Urban's wife, Vilhelmina, which would be my great-great-grandmother, and that's her daughter. Louisa was born in 1860. She was two years old in 1862 when the U.S. Dakota War took place. And the story that my grandmother passed down to me was that Louisa and her mother had to hide in the prairie grass outside their home as the Native Americans rode through. Um, had they been captured? Yeah, I wouldn't be telling this story because that would be the, that would have been the end of the line. But uh, that's my uh, my great great grandmother and my great grandmother. It's all through my mother's side of the family, so that's why the last names change. But it is a direct line of descent, and I uh, I'm very proud to be uh, a descendant of a fifth Minnesota soldier who fought here at the Battle of Nashville. The significance of the Battle of Nashville cannot be underestimated. Uh, it resulted in the complete routing of Hood's army of the Tennessee. Never again would the Confederates be on the offensive in the Western theater of the war. Hood's Tennessee campaign enabled Sherman to make his march to the sea unhindered. Um, the Civil War was shortened by months, perhaps a year or more. Minnesota's role in the battle cannot be underestimated. And as at Gettysburg, Minnesotans gave their last full measure of emotion. Any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Your point about immigrants is very, very well taken. It's true both in the South and the North. Uh, Nashville was the home, for example, of many Irishmen mm -hmm. and many Germans. And, uh, both groups enlisted in the Confederate Army to a very large degree for the very same reason that you say, a sense of belonging. Uh, and uh, if you go out to the <coughs> for example, you'll find that the Confederate Cemetery, the grave of Lieutenant Joseph Lipschitz, who uh, 
who was elected lieutenant of the Soviet Union. He was Jewish. And uh, he, his parents came from Germany. What was East Prussia then? And uh, probably Poland now. But, uh, he just said, yeah, it all seems strange. He said, uh, this is the, the religion that's founded on freedom from bondage uh, that we fight for this. But he, he gave it and, and it's his reason that he was accepted in the South. He was literate and well thought of. He was elected as a, as a lieutenant by a company of mountaineers. So and it's the same way. Both were the same. Thank you. And would you would you share with the audience so what you told me about the school field being oily? And I called it. I, I, I said that uh, I refer to Schofield as oily weasel. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, Sherman didn't like him, which is why he did not have to go with him to the city. Uh, he, he, he said that uh, his opinion was he had, he had all Thomas's vices and none of Thomas's virtues. But in addition to that, he was he was truly a weasel because he was dealing with the War Department trying to undermine Thomas, who was so naive they had no idea that, that one of his supporters would be doing this. Uh, one, of, one of Thomas's staff officers sat down and said, "Somebody is telling me this, and there's some of the access to the telegraph, and it can only be one person." And in Schofield, then later when Schofield became the commander of the Army of the United States, uh, there was a little bit of shredding that apparently in the, in the War Department records. So, uh, so shredding's nothing new, you know. Yeah. We, we, we hear about we hear about the scandals today. Uh, it's better than goats, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of stuff was going on uh, back then as well. Yes, ma'am. Was there any pursuit of the after the battle, and if not, why? Uh, no, the Union Army pretty much stood around and, and licked its own wounds. Uh, it's, it's a lot like uh, after Gettysburg, where uh, the army was, Lee's army was allowed to allowed to escape, uh, pretty much. Uh, you know, I, I think I think that was uh, a source of irritation uh, for uh, for Lincoln and, and Tom, or, you know, Grant, pardon me. Regarding Thomas as well, um, and why don't you why don't you follow up and, and defeat them? I mean, they're they're scattered to the wind. There were still other battles uh, after Nashville. In fact, my great great grandfather went on to fight down at uh, Spanish Fort, which is Fort Blakely in, in Mobile. Uh, it's uh, part of the, the Mobile defense, the late one. Uh, this is after Farragut, of course, takes uh, Mobile Bay. But there's still forts around it that uh, had to be taken, and my great great grandfather was there uh, fighting at Spanish Fort. Uh, that's actually where he uh, contracted uh, what they called bloody dysentery, uh, which affected him for the rest of his life. He did return to Minnesota uh, and resumed his life as a as a farmer uh, near Minnesota Lake, which is uh, only 25 miles from Mankato. But uh, he was never quite the same. And my grandmother. Who I knew, and this is the neat part, I knew her, and she actually knew my great-great-grandfather when she had met him as a child. And she said he was a very nice man, but uh, he had a lot of stomach problems. And that was the result of uh, his war, war injury here, uh, or actually here uh, in Old Bay. Um, but no, they didn't, they didn't do a good job of, of following up. But they actually did all the way to the Tennessee River very aggressively with uh, Wilson's cavalry and a lot of the infantry, but then it was winter after fell, that. Fell and, apart. Yeah, yeah. fell apart. December 18, yeah. uh, the, the Union forces had chased the end of the battle. They had already recovered Franklin. They were at the uh, Duck River in, in Columbia. And at that point... So they're going back the way they came. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, Forrest, who had been over in Murfreesboro, played that part of the battle. The most brilliant cavalry in the war, joined with his army and became the rear guard. And at that point, things slowed up a little bit because they had frozen over. And uh, by the uh, day after Christmas, Hood's army was across the Tennessee. And part of 
other delay was, was applicable to the fact that uh, uh, through bad staff work, the Union Army pontoon train had been directed to go to Columbia by way of Murfreesboro, which is kind of like uh, uh, going to, to Paris by way of Tokyo. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not the best A route. long way around. Yeah, it's not the best route. And, uh, and they figured out that they were marching down Murfreesboro Pike. They had to turn around and do a 180 and head out and follow them up. So they were not able to bridge the Duck River uh, because of the staff issue. Uh, Hood finally got across the river and destroyed his pontoon bridge and was safe, I believe, on uh, New Year's Eve. So it was a two week campaign to chase him out of the state. Uh, he lost a large number of desertions during the time. And people in soldiers in Tennessee chose to uh, say, Well, I'm, I'm here and I'm going to stay. Uh, and Paroles are being issued a mile a minute by, by uh, Thomas's people. So right. it was by, by the Civil War standards a pretty aggressive pursuit. It was uh, uh, not like Grant chasing Pemberton into, into Vicksburg, but it was, it was close to. It. But as you said, the winner becomes a factor. Um, mm -hmm. They had they had exceptionally brutal winner. All right, any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. When I was planning to come down here about a week or so ago, somebody told me something that in this whole trip, I've never heard any of it, anybody tell me that this was really true. So I, what I want to say, I don't want to know if there's any truth to it. What I was told is that um, the general or whoever was in charge of the battle had wanted some troops from Ohio to go and try to charge up Shy's Hill. And these Ohio troops refused. And that's when the Minnesota troops jumped in and said, we'll do it. Is there any truth to that? I haven't run into that at all. Does it, can anyone okay. flesh that out for us? No. There's no, no truth to it. No. Uh, I, I've, never, I've never run into Ken, it. Ken, you know, well, you know the composition of, of, of no. uh, well, the, the troops on the, uh, the 23rd Corps was Army of, of the Ohio men, and yeah. Schofield would, would charge the, wouldn't take the hill at yeah. noon when he was supposed to, but, uh, and, and needed prodding from, it's from, true. from, from Thomas, and, yeah. and so that was one of the reasons that MacArthur took the initiative to and, charge uh, the hill uh, himself. What's his name's brigade on the right? Um, Coach? No, no, it's, it's part of the Parker's division. Oh, 10th Minnesota's Brigade. Uh, McMillan's Brigade? What? No, McMillan's Brigade? Yeah, or? McMillan. They had a Ohio Regiment. They had two, they had, uh, yeah. two, two Ohio and They regiment. attacked uh, Full Tilt. Right? Oh, yeah, no, they, they did, but, but Schofield's men were largely composed yeah, they of Ohio's Ohio's too. Uh, regiment, yeah. Ohio Regiment. Ohio Regiment. A lot of times that's where the comment was that yeah. Schofield was, you know, called the Army of the Ohio. Yeah. Those men, so they wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't take, he wouldn't charge. Now he was convinced that Hood was going to uh, attack on the right flank where, yeah, you know, there are no, the nearest Confederates to his right flank were somewhere in Alabama, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are there any other questions or comments? Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'd like to conclude with just a few words. Uh, you're going to recognize these from uh, Lincoln's uh, first inaugural address, which was delivered March 4th, 1861. Um, but he was pleading with the South uh, to stay in the Union or actually come back into the Union at that point. Um, and he closes with these words, which I think are appropriate. They really sum up uh, our experience here in Nashville. Uh, so I'm addressing this to our southern friends as well as our northern friends. Uh, I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. 
Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave, to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Thank you all.